Hey guys, Kirk Barrett here, uh, and welcome back to the Best Practices Show. Uh, I got a great episode from a good friend of mine, Paul Sletton, who has handled transitions, thousands of them, thousands and thousands of them. He's my guy in transitions. So the cool thing about doing this for 25 years is there's some bad things that happen in dentistry. There's some good things that happen in dentistry, and having uh, colleagues or friends that can help you in some of the most critical times. The stuff that he deals with, I would never want to do. And he's also learned it very well. So you're going to see tips from an expert, a true expert in transitions on what to do and not to do. And you're going to see Paul is a very caring person, but he's a straight shooter and extremely candid. He's going to tell you about a tough lunch that he had with two potential partners and uh, some other potential sticky conversations. In our hope is that you learn from this and just help create a better practice and a better life, no matter what you decide to do. So check that out and uh, hope you enjoy it. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us at actdental.com where we're just committed. You're going to see we're going to keep bringing you stuff like this. And every single piece, I hope it adds just a little bit more value to your life. So make sure you share it with your friends. Hope you guys enjoy the episode. We'll see you soon. just pumped to be doing this and so um thank you i appreciate that and uh you know you guys um I, we're just gonna roll if that's okay i'm just gonna i already hit the record button and i didn't even tell you okay. that but because i think you could appreciate this the candid conversation now you guys i am a practice coach we're pra paul's my guy like paul is the guy that handles all like you're the specialist I, when I when people ask me questions that are outside of my circle i'm like we're gonna bring in the specialist we're gonna bring in paul like there are some interest. This is the greatest profession ever, but owning, transitioning, understanding all that stuff is critical to you. I mean, one bad move can set you up to dislike the profession, your business, and your life. And our goal with this series is I just want you to hear from the experts um, good lessons, bad lessons, warning signs, frameworks. And if you're looking at buying a practice, transitioning a practice, bringing in a partner, getting associate. Go to Paul. Like Paul has a company, and um, I, I just I love you, man. You just help us all with all these great questions. And I don't even know what the topic is today. What are we gonna? <laughs> Let's talk about adding a dentist to a practice. Okay, so uh, adding a now at, so we should probably clarify adding a dentist to a practice, and we can just keep it as that, right? What do you sure. think? All right, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, let's do it. So adding, so if I'm a dentist, okay, so if you're a dentist listening, this is, and you're going to add a dentist to your practice, I want you to listen to this. I want you to take notes. I want you to reach out to Paul. And Paul, I want them to know who you are. I always like that on our, our show, just like a little background. If I'm a dentist and I'm driving my car right now, I'm listening to this. Why should I listen to you? Who are you? Who's Paul Sletton? We work exclusively with this. We're at the Sletton Group in Denver, and we have clients all over the country. And we work exclusively with the dental profession, helping them plan and implement successful transitions. And uh, at this point in my career, I've been at it a good while. We've done transitions in all 50 states, and I've done a few more than 4,000 transitions wow. in my career. And I still love it, and they're and they're. I love the profession. I love the people we get to work with. We're so blessed at the quality of folks For sure. that uh, that we're able to help. Yeah, boy, this episode we could call it the good, bad, and ugly, but we probably won't. So we'll, we'll just call it adding a dentist. Okay, so where do we even start? I have a million questions on this. So adding a dentist. What do you mean by that title? And where? Why is this title? of this podcast so important more probably now than ever. It could, it could pertain to adding an associate okay. to a solo practice. It could pertain to, to adding another dentist 
to a group practice. Uh, and, and what I've noticed is that some people do it very haphazardly, like it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. It's far more complex uh, than, than it would seem at first blush. People do add Dennis and, and get lucky. They found the right one uh, and, and it ends up working. But I'd like, to, I'd like to bring them today a model for how to do that and the steps right. in, involved and the importance of the steps. Oh, I'm digging this because I love I love steps. I love a menu. I love a recipe. I love a checklist. And so you take us down this road. Do we start with maybe start with this? Do when do you do I qualify as somebody who should add a dentist or shouldn't add a dentist? I don't know. This is your podcast. You tell me. So where do we start? Where's the first step, Paul? I think you can add a dentist when you when your practice is robust, when it's growing, when it's healthy when it's trending uh, in a positive direction. And when you, in a general practice, when you have enough active patients to be able to handle another dentist. Right. So one of the first steps in the, in the, uh, in the transition process is to uh, appraise your practice's capacity to add another dentist. Because if your practice is not large enough, problems uh, are they're going to happen. Right. If, if it is large enough or if you're cutting your role back to allow patients to move over to the incoming doctor, uh, that that certainly can work. Right. If if somebody has 900 active patients, uh, they're not ready to add another dentist. Right. If somebody has has 2000, they're on. They may be ready or or they may not be ready, but it, it's important to appraise that yeah, and, and to talk about that. So, so the, the beginning, last time we did a podcast together a few weeks ago, we talked about partnerships and we talked about uh, some of the things that can go wrong in partnerships and, and other things that need to go right for them to be labeled as successful. Uh, and it all begins with the owner host doctor or doctors updating their vision prior to the prior to going out and starting to look for somebody right now so I might, to, go ahead no you well i'm sorry because i i love learning now i'm going to introduce probably a little bit of messiness in this and then you're going to see paul being the specialist is going to help us out of there so you know we're all going to i like the words uh, position of strength you know and you use you know the same concept which is you kind of want to be bursting at the seams to add another doctor um and, and i see it all too often a dentist is like yeah i'm adding four new ops and i'm like why and they're like for the associate i'm like so do you have an associate they're like no i don't but i'm gonna get one and uh and then they only have like 1300 new page, you know, 1300 active patients. So that would yeah. be like a no. Um, but there, but the other component of it is the vision piece of it. So I want to speak to this is like, sometimes Paul, and this is just my opinion. So you guys are listening to the podcast on this is dentists are taught that the only thing they can do is scale, grow, add, scroll, scale, grow, add. And that isn't for everyone. You know, it isn't. Some dentists don't like other dentists. And I always tell dentists, like, you should never have a partner and associate. They go, yeah, I should. I go, no, you don't even like other dentists. You're the first one to complain when you when somebody touches your stuff. You go, don't touch my stuff. And then I sit with you at a seminar because you're a dentist. And you look at everybody else's dentistry, including the best. You go, that's terrible. I don't like any of that. And you're just constantly miserable. I don't think you're a good candidate for working with another <laughs> dentist because you just like it the way you like it. Now, one other piece, and I want you to help us out of this. I hate, absolutely hate, can't say hate loud enough, the word coverage. People say, I'm going to get a whole bunch of other dentists for coverage. I'm like, <laughs> do they need blankets, like umbrellas? What do you, well, no, I need other dentists so I can go away. I, and I'm like, okay, so you're going to build this monstrosity and add all these dentists so you can go away. Well, what happens when you lose two of the four? You're not going away anywhere. You can get a friend who's an oral surgeon, you can find a, so like, I want you to transition someday. 
I want you to use Paul. I want you to sell your practice. I maybe want you. Now, I shouldn't even say that. Like, all those things are options. But remember, this is America. You don't have to do it one way. And everything these young dentists see, I, won't, I don't want to say everything, but a lot of it is this scale, grow, repeat, add, second location. And they talk to these young kids, and I love them. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to build this first location, then a second location, and a third one. And I'm not opposed to that, but I'm like, have you ever hired anybody? They go, no. I go, well, let's start with a first hire. You know, like, uh, so can you speak to, I know I just screwed everything up, but can you speak to all that? Sure. Um, I completely agree with your comment about, about adding someone for coverage. I think when you're at considering adding a, another dentist, you want to add somebody who can make you better, right? who can make the practice better, more accessible to patients and someone that fits, fits with the culture of the practice. So you need to really look for talent and, and, uh, if you have an exceptional practice, you have got to find an exceptional young dentist Yeah, uh, to make it work. Somebody that aspires to be part of what you have and what you and your team have created. Okay, so let's go down that path. I love what you're saying. Somebody that makes us better. But Paul, they're, they're not just out there floating around. Like I haven't had yeah. a few knock on my door in the last couple months, you know? So the first question is, if I'm a dentist, listen to this, adding a dentist, where do I find one? How do I find one? And when I do, what does the courtship process look like, even in its most basic sense? What we do is, is uh, this is really a team-based process. So when we're working with a client, we involve the team in the, uh, in, in the process of identifying what an ideal candidate profile would look like. So when you're going out to recruit or to find somebody to bring into your practice, you have to make some determinations as to who would fit in your practice and who wouldn't. And, and we help with that process, we facilitate that process, but really they come up with a list of an ideal, of ideal candidate attributes that they want to see in that chosen uh, and selected young dentist. Yeah, give us a little hint what's in the list. Is it more of clinical skills? Are you looking for core values or attitudes or behaviors or patterns? What are you looking for? Like what, what, what might show up on that list, Paul? Clinical skills are, are ex extremely important, of course, but it's really a list of intangibles. It's a list of, of uh, core values. That, that need to be in, in link with the core values of the practice. Right. They're, they're, you need to talk about work ethic. You need to talk about what does this person, without learning anything about the opportunity at first, but just being interviewed and screened and vetted, uh, what are they looking to do ideally with their future? What are they looking for? What have they been exposed to? And uh, we love the candidates who've looked at 10 practices mm. as possible practices to buy or to, or to go into. And because they've got some perspective that someone who hasn't looked at practice, other practices will not have. Yeah. The they, they've seen what they like, what they don't like, buyer beware, all that kind of stuff. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They have to like women. They have to be comfortable around women. So many of our teams are made up of women or yeah. mostly women. And, and that's, a, that's an intangible, but it's an incredibly important one. For sure. But a, and a huge one is, are they coachable? Wait, okay. So go back to that. Now define coachable. Cause you ask me if I'm a young dentist, are you coachable? I'm going to tell you yes, of but course. define what that is. De defining coachable means, are you hungry to learn? Are, are you on a daily basis? Are you looking for, for new skills and, and new services you can bring to that patient? Right. Uh, are you looking to grow and develop yourself? Because if, because if somebody's going to be exceptional, they're going to have to do an awful lot of work on themselves. For sure. In, in terms of their own personal growth and development. Yeah. Uh, we've had, in the past year, We've had two young dentists that, that really stand out, who've come into our, our client practices and, and are just 
blowing the roof off in terms of team acceptance, patient acceptance. Uh, they're glad to have them in there and they're productive as heck without any any pressure to become productive right. quickly. You know, so, they just fit. Yeah, so what's the secret behind that? I mean, if you were to point out, put your finger on like, there were three things that made them, it, was it all that you pointed to before? Their core values? I mean, have we already illustrated those or is there anything else that we might wanna be on the lookout for? In the interviewing process, uh, we, we get into an awful lot of things. We I've, I've created a, uh, a personal profile, which is an essay style uh, question and answer. It's about 30 pages long that, that when, a, when a prospect, a candidate begins to emerge as a serious candidate and they've cleared some hurdles already, we, we have them fill out that, that uh, questionnaire and, and it, it covers an awful lot of things, but it focuses on what do you aspire to what do you want out of your out of your dental career? And and if you could be in an ideal situation in five years, describe it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, so you begin to get some insights. We don't want to tell them all about the practice opportunity that we're advertising for and thus coach them on how to interview. Yeah. That's where I go wrong. So I usually have people in, I like them too much. And then I spend like the whole interview, like selling them on why they'd want to be here. And then I'm like, well, you should tell me about yourself. Well, I've just given them a green light on how to manipulate me through the interview. And that's why they don't let me do any more interviewing around here. So I'm going to go back to a couple of things. Cause I love, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down on the whole core values thing. And you know, as I'm getting older, I'm 51 now, I've realized like this whole core values thing. And I was just telling my team in our morning huddle, I, I'm like, you guys, we've been teaching this forever. We know it's important, but the more you lean into it, the more as a dentist, you lean into core values. You have them everywhere. You talk about them. You live them. They're actions. They're non-negotiable behaviors. The less crazy stuff you ever deal with. Like you deal with less and less crazy stuff. And you know the crazy stuff makes you insane. And so I'll add one more thing. And Paul, you tell me if this is true. This is pretty strong to say this, but when your core values don't match up with another human being like a dentist. It never, ever, 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 ever works long-term. Something will break in a big way because you can't change their DNA. You can't, your favorite people in the end of the day, they care about the same things. And is that what you're, what you're speaking to? Absolutely. That is what I'm speaking to. Over my career, I've been called into a number of situations where they've already added an associate Mm -hmm. And the associates, let's say, been there for four or five months and they and they invite me to come in and take a look at what's going on there. And you start interviewing the team and say, hey, how's this working? You know, how is is he a fit or is she a fit? And and, you know, after an hour in the practice first morning, you've got some really good insights into why it isn't working. Wow. And the end and the end result is that you uh, you help them separate to the utter relief of both parties. You know, I, went, I got called into a, a practice in California years ago and, and the doctor uh, had just brought somebody on board and I went in for a two day consult and evaluation of the practice. And by noon the first day, I went to lunch with the two doctors and said, you are never going to fit or make it as partners. And, and uh, they both uh, took that emotionally, but they both are relieved. They both sent me letters. After, so I packed it up and went home that afternoon. Yeah. And, and uh, to their utter relief. Yeah, that sounds like a rough lunch. Um, and I love, but at the same token, that's what I love about you is you have turned away from opportunity and, and you, even when we've unfortunately had dentists pass away, which is always horrible. You're like, nope, we, in the end, it's not about the money. We got to make sure that everybody gets to the right place. And that's what I appreciate about you as a straight shooter. Now, some dentists don't like to hear this, you know, no, 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 Paul, you don't understand. We went to dental school together. Our last names 
are both start with C. We sat right next to each other all through dental school. I am the godparent to his kids. He's the godparent. We love each other. That'll never happen to us. What do you say to that? Well, then just go play golf together. <laughs> you know, that that's actually pretty, that's a great response. Play golf together. Start a study club together. Don't go into business right. together. Right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So go, go, but no, no, no. We've already started. I already started building out these ops. We've already started the paperwork. You don't I understand. Know. I've already told my wife, we've already sold our house in the old town. You know, we're all, you said this to me years ago, we're already walking down the aisle and now you're telling us not to get married. What do I do now? I mean, this is, we're making it funny, but it's not funny. It's not funny. And, and cutting it off sometimes uh, brings clarity to each party and and they go on and, and are much more fulfilled right. than they would have. It's like having a, an anchor around your neck if you're in a really bad relationship with somebody. If you've got one person who's really hungry to learn and become better every year and you have a, the other person who's not interested in that at all, there's no chance that's going to work. Right. In a practice or in a marriage or in any, you know, any way. Yeah. Now, this is no different than getting married, no different than having kids. Like, we're, our goal is not to scare you away from getting a dentist or a partner. We just want to make sure that you go into this with clear expectations. And this is my opinion. Again, I'm not the expert. Paul is. I, I tell people that are getting, going into partnerships, like, okay, so you want to be partner? Partnerships are not marriages. They go like, it's like a marriage. No, it's not. It's 10 times harder than a marriage. My wife is amazing. I've been married for 22 years. She can put up with my crap, you know, and she can give me some. When you're in a partnership, they don't often put up with it. And sometimes the best partnerships, like you shared with us in the last podcast, they end up never talking just because it if they did, it would just explode. So what we're trying to do here is lay some of the groundwork so that when you go down at a dentist, you're just doing it the right way. And it's, you know, you're, you're, and I would also say this, don't do the big stuff without the help of an expert. Don't buy a practice without the help of the, don't add a partner without the help of an expert. Don't like grow 17 operatories. It's great to pay for an expert who will go, nope, I've done 4,000 of these. You don't want to do that. Or, um, you know, so, all right, so let's get back on pass. So, so let's say I found somebody with a great core values. We're matching up. I like this kid. They, they've they got a hungry work. I, I can tell they want to be coached. I actually took him to a course. He sat right next to me, took some notes, asked some great questions. What do I, where do I go then? What's our next step? Well, the next step is that is that by that time, and, and we're trying to give a model here for making these things work and work really well. Right. So you remember, you've started from defining the ideal candidate profile and the attributes you want that person to bring to the game. So the, you use that then when we're when we're helping people do a search and placement, we use that uh, when we're interviewing candidates. Right. We we use that when when we start to screen and and get to know people. And uh, and when you do that and you take your time and you're patient. Um, it it can really work well. We have a client uh, in the last three years. We did a search and placement for a client in San Francisco and the person selected was the 32nd person interviewed and screened. Wow. And we that same year we did one and, and the associate who was who was selected and she's now becoming a partner and, and it's just a great success story. Yeah. And and we've had lots of experience where it's the first or third candidate that shows up, you know, and it's so it, it's it's not when they come, but if if you're not finding the one you want, be patient. Mm -hmm. Be patient because the right one is out there. Yeah, and you've learned that already too. If you own real estate, you never just lease to the first person that wants. You're better off keeping it vacant until you find the right occupant because you're going to tie this thing up for quite a while. Same thing up comes to uh, adding a dentist. Now, give me some line of sight. So I'm a de if I'm a dentist, I'm thinking technically like, Paul, there's a lot of different ways we could do this. We're going to bring them in as an associate, eventually a partner. You know, like, is there... 
you, you know, when, when I'm considering the path, what's, what's the path that's most considered or a good healthy path by adding a dentist? If you're bringing them in with any potential to become a partner eventually after and only after a highly successful initial employment phase yeah. where they're a non-owner, so it's not automatic that they're going to buy in in two years, regardless of how they fit or anything else. That's got to be really successful. Uh, then right at the beginning, you also have to talk about a pathway to partnership okay. and define and define what what would uh, what a highly successful initial employment phase would look like. Right. In other words, what are your expectations and what are the expectations of the incoming doctor? Right. And then and then even up front, we like to talk about about how the partnership will function once formed. Right. How will how will the what will the roles of the doctors be? If it's a solo practice, you're going into a shared leadership model. What, what will that look like? Right. And and how will that function? And uh and, and what's the estimated value of the practice right today? And how will that, how will we readdress the value at the time of the buy-in? Yeah, yeah. So go back to a couple of those things. Now, assessing sure. the value, because you're gonna have these moments in time where we gotta take a snapshot of this is what it's valued with so that we can actually have data and numbers to discuss if we add another dentist or a third dentist later on, or if we decide, or if I transition out a little bit early, no, 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 when you came on, the practice was valued at this, it's actually a number in that respect. And then also on the equity play side of things, I mean, we learned this from the, the DSOs. The DSOs, whether you like them or not, they understand that the best ones need some type of future buy-in. They need something to anchor in because if this is just going to be a job where I'm going to get paid on production, that's short-lived. Don't you agree? So the equity play, these young dentists are taught to ask the equity play, don't you think for the most part or not so much? I think they do. Yeah. You're the, the hungriest ones and by far the best candidates out there want ownership. Right. Wait, wait, they wait. Want Okay, yeah. keep going. I'm sorry. No, keep going because I have a thought on that. Okay, they uh, they want ownership. They ha they're the ones with the fire in their bellies. Right. They're the ones who aspire to get better every year. They're the ones who are more likely to match the culture of the practice they're coming into. And so you need to talk about how the partnership's going to function once formed. How will the partners uh, share the practice overhead expenses and and doctor income? Right. What will that look like? Right. Uh, and and what defines a trigger point, which is the moment when the incoming doctor will be ready to buy in because they're in a viable condition financially and productivity wise. Right. Themselves. Right. Now, go back to I want you to go back to this, because I think what you said was perfect. I run into situations where dentists bring in an associate. And here's what they say. Ah, they're not that good. They're not that motivated. Well, we brought them in under the guise of that. Like we were, they were looking for a couple days and they, you know, just wanted a place to work and a job to kind of clock in and clock out. And then they get upset or a little, you know, out of equity with the fact that the dentist doesn't want to do a lot of the extra work. You just, in those, those dentists aren't bad. They're, they actually fit a great role in dentistry. And it doesn't matter if they're male or female, doesn't. Their expectations about what they're going to do with their dental career are very clear, but often the dentist that brings them in isn't. They bring in somebody who they got on the cheap, who's really nice to work with, and then later they get upset that this person doesn't have a lot of fire in their belly. What you're talking about is if you're looking to add somebody who's going to bring a lot of value, they're often going to want, you know, some equity in the future. And, um, can yes. you talk, okay. So can you talk about what equity looks like? I know it's, it's different for everybody, but if I'm a dentist looking to transition or add another dentist, what does it look like in the marketplace today? The, uh, the only way somebody's going to ever be able to buy into a practice is if the practice is healthy and growing. Okay. And if, and, and if it will cash flow, and and the buyer will be able to 
to pay the their share of the overhead expenses and their note payment from school loans and uh, and have a good living income once they've done that right and not be an indentured servant while they're paying off their note Right. So there's a there are a lot of components when you when you take when you do a, an interviewing process you really have to take time to get to know the the people that you're interviewing not just a, a one or two interviews you've got to get to know them mm -hmm. and and the and the personal profile that we've put together really gives insights into uh, into that for example I've got one right here in front of me. Um, one of the questions is what are the five most personally significant accomplishments in your life? Whoa. What is the accomplishment? What year did it happen and why is it significant to you? So you're not doing any coaching. You're asking them to say, Hey, uh, here's who I am. Here's what I'm all about. And, and so on. And, and to list those things and becomes a great discussion piece. Yeah. And then we move, and then we move from that Kirk into saying who has influenced you along the way? Whoa. Who, who it, friends and friends and, and family, uh, mentors, uh, instructors, and, and it's fascinating to see who they list and and why that person was influential. Yeah. And that gives you that also gives you more insights into what they're really looking for. Right. And you're also, no, you guys, if you're listening, those are fabulous questions, questions that aren't often asked by dentists. And I would love to know the answers to those questions. Like I'm so crazy curious because I feel like I'm going to learn the fabric of this person that I'm talking to a lot more those accomplishments, why, when they happen. So like, I'll just, I'll just go off. Like I was a three-time employee of the month at Applebee's when I was in my 20s. Now, I consider that one of the most important accomplishments in my life. Let me tell you why. We were broke growing up. I learned to work hard. And when other servers didn't want the shift, I'm like, you're crazy. I'll take that shift. And I always drive by an Applebee's and I say to my kids three times and they're like, dad, you're so weird. I'm like, I took great pride in knowing how to serve people. And I wanted to win it a fourth time. They wouldn't let me. But like, it's so like... And it, it I, this isn't about me, but you get a sense like when somebody gives you their accomplishments, you get, you can figure out their why, like what. And there's a good chance they might repeat something like that in their future. Correct? Correct. Exactly. We and we have them do a ten year visualization. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. go back to that. What is that? What is that? And, and it it says they create a time capsule. We ask them to create a time capsule. Okay. So today, so today it's December second, twenty twenty one. Let's let's time travel to December second, twenty thirty one. Right. How old are you? Where do you live? What are you doing? Tell me tell me about your family. And and what is what significant accomplishments have you made in the last ten years? So you get them thinking in the present tense, ten years out there. Yeah. So then we're not asking questions. If if it, if somehow it was possible, what would you aspire to? That that is a question that doesn't take you anywhere. Right. But if you ask them to time travel ten years out, uh, and and write their answers in the present tense, you get amazing feedback and and input from them, and you get wonderful insights into what they're all about. Yeah, and they might not even be able to answer the question. That'll tell you something too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So when we, when we use these tools in, in the recruitment and placement process, the first thing we do with these, with these same uh, tools, the personal profile, we have the owner fill one out first. When we're doing planning with a, with a dental couple, we have, we have the doctor and the spouse before we do the planning session, fill out these personal profiles. Okay. And, 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 and to do it independent of one another, don't sit down at a table and say, how did you answer that question? Right. Do it, do it individually and then come together and see what you have. Right. And it, 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 uh, it opens the door to amazing conversations and really smooths out the road to putting a good plan together. Right. I love this. Now it does it, does the process change at all? If it's my nephew, or my son that's coming in. Paul, 
We don't have to do all this. It's my nephew. I've known my nephew forever. Do we do any less steps when it becomes a family member? Yes, it's not a 30-page questionnaire, then it's a 50-page questionnaire. Whoa, why? It, why? They have, they have to do so much more work than Smith and Jones would because they have so much more at stake. And you can't make assumptions. Hey, we're family. We have the same values. We aspire to the same things. Baloney. That's not true. Within families, if, if you have four kids, no two of them are alike. They're all different, right? You can say that all, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they, but they all look at things differently and, they, and, and experience things differently. Yeah. And, and so you want those insights. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, so I've gotten through the first hard, this is kind of like American Ninja Warrior. I've already gotten through the water. Now I'm getting to the next, now I'm getting to the impossible or harder parts of the, uh, the obstacle course. So let's say we pass the test and you look at me and this dentist and you go, you guys are actually a good fit. What do we do? do next? How does the process look moving forward from there? We use personality profiles on them okay. for them to gain insights into, into each other uh, in, in terms of how to effectively work together in a business relationship. Um, if there's a, if, if they're married, we include the spouses in, in the uh, conversations because they're huge stakeholders right. and they're going to have big input and influence on the doctors and uh and, and so we want to make sure they're at the table learning things firsthand um if there's a significant other it, it's more of a judgment call right we worked with a dentist one time from from the northeast who had been married three times and he was and divorced three times and now he would and his estate got carved up three times and now he's 61 and he's coming for a planning session to Denver and uh, he brings his new girlfriend. And, and we have a session where we talk about their finances. Uh, we don't do financial planning or anything like that, but where we say, where are you in, in preparation for the next 10 years? And uh, in what kind of condition are you in? And so on. And, and uh, that was gonna be the afternoon session. She, she sat in on the initial morning session, the new girlfriend, and I said, I don't think it's appropriate for her to be here this afternoon and and here's why and laid it out and man did she get ticked whoa this kind of sounds like the lunch you had prior to that with the <laughs> these she are potentially back, hot why why'd she get ticked she took the rental car went back to the hotel packed her bag and went to the airport and flew home and i said thank god she did that she revealed who she really is and, and uh, that would have been a terrible thing because you're going for number four right there. Yeah. All I can say is you do the work I would <laughs> never want to do. <laughs> you know, and the other thing I would say is, it, guys, 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 if you're listening, crazy people, they don't know they're crazy. They just don't. You know, so, like, I think yeah. it's important to slow the process down. Let's cross every T, dot every I, and then some of the, you're going to see some of this stuff bubble up and you're going to go, whoa, 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 red flag, red flag. Um, I would imagine along the way in some of these things, right? Yep. Yeah. I would define myself as caring and candid. People, people deserve to know what the, what the truth is and what they're likely to experience and encounter by going this way or that way or a third way. Yeah. And so if there are options available to them in a, in, when we help them in planning sessions, we'll look at all three options and flesh them out. Yeah. Each one and, and, and say which one feels or looks the best. Yeah. If you want the truth, hire Paul. If you want somebody to tell you what you want to hear, hire somebody else. That should tell you a lot. Now, I, uh, you and I agree almost on everything except one thing. Now, if you're listening, this is what you're going to want to do on your note card at home. I am not an expert on this. So you're just going to just basically discount what I'm going to say. But the whole ownership and equity thing, I have always been a believer that no <laughs> partnership should ever be 50-50%. Now, let me explain. There, You can always move in that direction. But at the end of the day, somebody's going to have the 1% saying, hey, listen, when I'm ready, I'll sell you the last 1% because no, we're not going to be... A, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, we're not going to go in a weird direction with insurance or, you know, weird stuff. Like somebody's got to hold the balance of the phone number, the actual brand title, things like that. And you are of the opinion that a 50-50 works better. Now, again, Paul's the expert. So, Paul, can you just give us give us your thoughts on that? And be be candid. You don't have to agree to me because you know I, I love what you're going to say no matter what. But what do I need to know as a dentist who's selling or buying about the 50-51 or 50-50? I don't, we don't always recommend 50, 50, okay. but, but I like, I, I do like, uh, equal ownership, uh, when, when the parties have proven that they work together effectively, they've gone through a, a highly successful initial employment phase and, uh, and so on. So, so I think 50, 50 works well there. Even if you're 50 50, you can, you can, one person can be, one of the partners can be designated as the managing partner. Okay. Contractually. And I strongly recommend that. All right. And that, and, and uh, the managing partner would be compensated for being the managing partner. You would still discuss everything, all purchases, all major investments in new technology and things like that uh, together, of course. But but the managing partner carries the influence as a tiebreaker. Right. We we do though. Like right now, we we're we're working in a situation where our client is owns a hundred percent of his own practice. The first person we're actively recruiting, which we are right in the midst of right now, will come in and and eventually be able to own twenty five percent. And then the next person we recruit for him will eventually own 25%. Right. And the third and final person will own 25%. This person has an unbelievable practice. Yeah. And, and, can, and can easily do something like that over 10 years. Um, and so in that situation, the end game then would be that the, the host owner, founder of the practice, they each of the four of them will own twenty five percent. Yeah, and then and then the others will buy him out because he'll be ready to retire, and and leave. But but this is all conditional on things working really really well. Right, right. Um, it, it, one of my biases, and I certainly admit it's a bias. One of my biases is that if you have a, if you have two people in a partnership and it's really really working well. Um, I can't get, I can't make much of a case as to why somebody should own 49 and instead of 50. Right. So yeah. that, that's my bias. And that's a good point. And, and I guess where I was going to go with this next is it isn't so much 51, 49. So, you know, if you're listening again, just get a, get a sense of, I was going to ask you about the whole you know, building into equity thing. Because remember, when I got started 25 years ago, a lot of dentists would sell half of their practice and they'd sell it to a dentist and then they'd grow it. And then, or they'd sell half and then another half and another half. And I just recently, I got to get this guy on a podcast. He's like, he stopped me at the ADA and he's like, you know, Kirk, you can actually sell a certain portion of your practice and then do it again, do it again. And he said this to me and I thought it was great. He goes, tell those dentists that do it that way again, because remember this is America you don't have to do it one way there's multiple ways to do this he said don't take the money take the payments and so he set up a payment system where he's getting payments from four doctors that are buying it he goes it is the most amazing like you know annuity that you could ever create yeah. um, so can you speak to that do you see stuff like that anymore as people are buying in you know sections of equity they're rare, but absolutely we do. Okay. We've, we've had historically uh, a large number of uh, clients who've done that. And we have some now who are doing that. And you couldn't find a one of them who wouldn't do it all over again the same way. Right. Yeah. Do they, and they, again, we're getting in the details, but they hold the paper on the notes, right? They do. And so remember, if this all goes bad, it goes back to you anyway. 
So, um, and then the long term, most of these dentists are pretty financially savvy. So they're like, they're not in a hurry to take the cash. They know that that payment coming in on a regular basis. And then also too, I mean, again, you can get super creative and this is why you need somebody like Paul. They can separate the practice and the real estate or they can lump them in. It, it, it's right. just, this can get extremely creative. Don't you agree? Absolutely. We've had, we've had clients, uh, we have one client who's taken the equity out of his practice six times and wow. he's still practicing. And, and, uh, and the only way you can do that, the only way you can do that to double back on what we talked about earlier is that you have a growing practice right. that's really healthy and really strong. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's something in a side, something that you mentioned, uh, earlier that I want to address. And that is people in solo practice need to have a transition plan. Everybody needs to have a transition plan, but people in solo practice need to have two transition plans. They need to have one for selling their practice eventually under ideal conditions where the practice is strong, they're healthy, they're still in the practice, it's growing, that those are ideal conditions, that's your ideal plan. But they also need a crisis plan because when you're practicing solo and something happens to you, you still have a business there that's really viable and valuable. But unless it's getting covered quickly and unless it's uh, unless somebody is being recruited to come in and buy it, um, it'll the value will will erode and shrink to nothing pretty quickly. Yeah, I want you to speak to that uh, because you've been a part of some situations that we've had that just, they're the hardest part of our work is, you know, saying goodbye to somebody we love. We lost a 47 year old dentist who was one of my favorite of all time and you were on a plane the next day. And I remember um, just the importance of like getting everything lined up right away. But let's go back to the safeguarding piece of it first, which is this, every dentist, you guys, if you're listening, those are two gold, Nuggets, a transition plan under ideal circumstances. And then Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach teaches the same thing. He said, everybody should have a 100 day plan in the event of your disable or um, death. And nobody ever thinks like that, like what gets yeah. executed by the day. And I think it's brilliant. Now I don't have a plan or a template that I can give you, but the, the point is this, you gotta, people don't think they're ever gonna die. Uh, and then do you have any research on this as a dentist? I've heard you're more likely to become disabled than die because of the physical elements. I don't know if that's true. I've heard somebody I say I think it's that. absolutely true. Really? We, Yeah, we've had more than 40 uh, dentists die suddenly that where we got involved in selling the practice. We've had a couple hundred clients who had to retire because they couldn't do it anymore. Wow. They were physically disabled. And, and uh, so, yeah, you, that, that you've got to have a plan and the plan's got to be so specific. We don't have time to get into that today deeply, but it's got to be so specific that it, that it designates who makes the call right. to get something going on covering the practice, right. uh, retaining the team, keeping hygiene going mm -hmm. in a general practice. Um, being covered by colleagues, yep. you know, things like that. Uh, who, because what happens is that families come in from around the country to be with the, with the grieving uh, widow or widower of, of the deceased, now deceased dentist. And they're also locked with grief. They shut down for a while. And if they go, they, they can go weeks before, hey, we've got a business here. Right. Uh, a viable business. We ought to do something about that. And, and meanwhile, the value, of, if they haven't done the right steps all the way up to that point, the value of the practice is shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. I got to so, be careful because this could be a seven hour episode because I have like 90 more questions because there's always. Yeah. So um, speak to that, you know, just the, the declining value after a death or disable uh, event. Is it is it like a cliff? Or is it, I mean, somebody's got to be on it daily. Wouldn't mm -hmm. you agree? Yes. So in the situation that you referred to, okay. that we worked uh, together, um, 
the first thing that happened is that the team made a video and they sent and they sent it out to all patients of record and it was in their message and this had just happened the death of their of their employer and and, and they sent it out and it, the, the message basically was we're grieving what has happened but we're still here mm. and this practice is still your practice and if you have an appointment we expect to see you and we're looking forward to seeing you whether it's hygiene or doctor appointment the practice is going to be covered which it was but the but the first thing was to keep the team together and that was a really powerful message so this all happened in may I, we got involved right away as you know and and uh the practice closed with the new buyer october one wow so that so that was and it took longer than we wanted but boy we we went through a, a lot of uh candidates and and people it was an awkward difficult situation you know how many i i, I stayed in touch with the team for a while it's been a while now but you know how many patients they lost how many 11. wow they lost 11 patients over all those months and they kept the entire patient base together and so the new owner is just going gangbusters in there and uh and the and the team's still together yeah and the patients are still in that practice see that's so an that's yeah. yeah that speaks to the team you know that's an amazing oh. story it is and i think i know who you're talking about and so i do know the dentist that uh and it and he you know they they're all very you know it was a tough toughest thing they've ever been through oh. but but on the other side they're they're doing well they're doing well so you know our, our goal for this particular episode wasn't to make this a somber thing but these are the realities of bringing in a dentist and some of the things that you have to think about and cover so that you just don't go into this blind and then wake up later and go, what the heck did I do? Now, Paul, any last, I know I don't get you forever. I wish I did. But like any last thoughts that you would add if I'm a dentist looking to add a dentist, what would be your final closing thoughts on this one? My, my closing uh, thought that I'd like to share is that, is that adding another dentist or adding an associate can be a wonderful experience that with great outcomes it can be you just have to be patient you have to have your own plan together you've got to learn everything you possibly can about them you you have to in the in the initial phase you have to compensate them well and and uh, but but you don't want to create somebody who just sits back and waits to be fed you want that incoming dentist to come in as though they're doing a scratch start within your practice and come with that sense of urgency. And these things can work out wonderfully well. Yeah. And we see evidence of that all the time. Yeah. And I would say this before you build it, before you hire anybody, before you interview anybody, before you even consider it, find an expert. Just ask them some questions. So Paul, I want people to reach out to you if they're even considering this. So if I'm listening, and I'm driving, first of all, pull over. Um, secondly, who do I call? How do I, how do I find you? What do you do? How could I get in touch with you? Our business uh, uh, phone number is 303-699-0990. And that's, a, that's the easiest way to get a hold of us. My email address is paul at lifetransitions.com. Awesome. Awesome. As always, Paul, I am super grateful for your help, your leadership, your mentorship. Uh, again, you're just my guy. You help me with, with all these things. So I want you to keep coming back. I, I mean, I feel like we could do a whole series on all these details. I actually want to have you back and talk about compensation specifics, like compensation formulas for maybe associates. That'd be a good one. And just what you're seeing in the marketplace, because I... I hear crazy stuff. And again, there's multiple ways to do it, but I like to hear what's working and what you found to be uh, best practices. So uh, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. Hey, if you have questions about 
you know, adding a dentist, like things that you'd like to hear from Paul or other, send them to us. I mean, I get suggestions all the time. I'll get Paul back on and we'll ask Paul like the hard questions and get him uh, to chime in and you'll find you'll always enjoy it. And uh, keep sending us for suggestions on everything else you guys want to see. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Mm-hmm.